Okay, so hello everyone. First of all, I'm very sorry that I cannot be there uh, in person. Hopefully with the next occasion, I'll have the chance to, to meet everyone. Um, thank you, first of all, to, to Anna and Diap and Hans for, for inviting me. It's a privilege for me to be able to present here today. Just a short introduction adding to what um, Hans mentioned. So I am currently a PhD researcher and a lecturer at VU Law Faculty, um, the Department of Transnational Legal Studies. Also part of the Transnational Legal Studies, we are working on launching a, a new research center, specifically Amsterdam Law and Technology Institute, and I'll be talking about this um, soon. Um, at VU, I'm also working as a legal expert, part of a cybersecurity capacity building project and a knowledge sharing project developed by the law faculty in collaboration with the University of Indonesia, uh, based on an AFIC grant. Uh, here, I'm also working with uh, Anna uh, Bon, who is the project manager of the project. In addition to the activities at VU, I am also involved in various legal advisory projects or mentoring projects, space and AI related, just some examples. Here I'm an elected legal expert, part of an international global expert group dealing with sustainable lunar activities. I'm also a mentor, part of the United Nations Space for Women Network, um, a recently launched network with the purpose of empowering women to study space law and related space disciplines. Also a mentor of, of part of Space Generation Advisory Council, again, uh, similar with the work at the United Nations, and uh, a must be member of the International Institute of Space Law and of the European Center for Space Law, part of the European Space Agency, where I give uh, lectures and presentations yeah, a couple of times per year. Before this, I was a business lawyer. I was based in Bucharest and Austria, part of international law firms such as Ellen Over and Wolf Ties. Um, a couple of mandates as a legal counsel before deciding to open my uh, boutique uh, law firm. All these, um, yeah, were possible due to my knowledge gathered at Vienna University of Economics and Business, where I was enrolled in an executive MBA. As mentioned earlier, I would like to briefly touch base um, related to one of, of our activities at the law faculty, part of the Transnational Legal Studies Department. Um, we are working these days in establishing the Amsterdam Law and Technology Institute uh, with a new mission statement, and that would be building a different future for law and technology. We'll have an official launch in September 2021. And I invite uh, everyone to, to follow our website, which is currently under construction, but in September it will be fully online. Um, the purpose of the Institute is to become a research hub connecting VU law experts, but of course also we are uh, seeking collaboration with external experts. And this is why um, at least some of us, we are actively uh, presenting the work of ALTI, part of various uh, international conferences, similar to what's happening today. Just to mention um, some focus areas, these are just, again, examples, not limitative. We are looking at emerging technologies, AI and blockchain, cybersecurity, internet government, sustainability, climate change, legal tech, autonomous weapons, space law, intellectual property. Uh, we are mainly looking at the legal and ethical aspects of these uh, technologies, but our projects also have a multidisciplinary approach similar to the one that I was mentioning, uh, developed based on the grant awarded by NUFIC. A little bit about our master uh, programs. So ALTI is off currently offering an international uh, technology law master. This is offered in, in English. Uh, we are basically um, 
attracting international students, but the, the number of students is growing every year. And we, we also notice an increase of the Dutch, of Dutch students. We're also offering uh, the Master Internet Intellectual Property and ICT offered in Dutch, a bachelor minor uh, called Technology Law and um, Ethics, again offered in English and summer, sometimes also winter academies. Part of um, IT, I am developing uh, my research and uh, establishing uh, uh, new courses. One of my uh, main area of uh, in interest is to introduce space law in the context of uh, our uh, educational uh, curricula at VU. So perhaps the first question would be, what is international space law or what is space law? And then perhaps the next question would be, why do you want to study this? Um, first of all, briefly, for the purpose of time, what is, again, space law? When we talk about space law, the first thing we think about uh, the United Nations Treaty it comprises a variety of international agreements, conventions uh, developed under United Nations. It's a branch of international law, a body of law governing space-related activities with impact in space, but also on Earth. And a couple of examples that I've prepared will make this statement more clear, more clear in a minute. The topics uh, dealing the, space, uh, the topics that space law is dealing with, just some examples, the preservation of the space and the earth environment, settlement of disputes, international cooperation, or liability for damage caused by space objects. Um, one of the reasons why I believe that integrating space law, part of the international technology law master that we're offering, is because space law is essentially driven by technology. I will come back to, uh, to the previous statement, but just to be, give a little bit of a background about this, uh, not necessarily new area of law, but perhaps less known. So space law started to become uh, known in the 1950s. Um, at the same time with the launch of the first satellite in space. You might have heard of Sputnik launched by Russia in the 1950s. And then of course, uh, law uh, followed quickly. So between 1950s and 1960s, well, we are noticing the foundations of these regulatory regimes, uh, res resolutions and other documents without abiding character are being issued. Between 1960s and 1980s, um, we notice a development of what is now called the core of Corpus Iuris Spatialis. Um, and here we have the core, again, of space law currently being developed, the five main treaties, uh, five main international treaties, the Outer Space Treaty, Liability Convention, Registration Convention, the Moon Agreement and the Rescue, uh, agreement, these are the five main documents dealing with space law. Of course, the law is evolving between 1980s, 1990s, a uh, series of uh, soft law, UN principles being uh, issued complementary to the five main treaties. Since 1990s and until the present times, a series of challenges are appearing to space law because in addition to states, the traditional actors, part of space law. Now the private sector is becoming more and more active, a phenomenon uh, currently being referred as the new space. Coming back to what I was mentioning earlier, uh, space law is essentially driven by a technology. But when we talk about space technology, we need to uh, take in consideration yeah, two main aspects. So space technology is used, of course, for space exploration and uh, outer space related activities, but also for improving, um, for supporting uh, life on Earth. And the reason why we are here today in the context of, uh, of this conference 
for supporting our digital societies on Earth. In terms of uh, very quickly, some examples about um, technology used for space exploration and other uh, space related activities, I have chosen some examples. For example, autonomous rovers, these are basically autonomous driving cars, but deployed in the outer space. You might have heard about Perseverance, the US rover, um, which landed the first on the, the first rover to land on, on Mars. This happened at the beginning of 2022. EU is preparing to launch a, a, a similar um, AI system again on Mars and also uh, China. Uh, in the uh, popular discussion, you, discussions, you will hear that currently Mars is the only um, planet inhabited only by uh, AI robots. Artificial intelligence is also used in space related activities for collision avoidance. Again, an example of, of space technology equipped with uh, AI capabilities. Um, you might have heard of uh, the topic space junk, space debris or space pollution. So apparently we're doing the same mistakes in space as we do on earth. There is a lot of space junk flying around the earth orbit, orbit and this causes a lot of uh, incidents. But now our uh, AI systems um, are helping operators, operators to avoid uh, collisions between satellites or between satellites and space junk. Um, AI is used in space-related activities also as crew assistance. Simon is an example of an AI personal assistant, the first one deployed on the International Space Station in 2018 and uh, developed by IBM. AI is also helping uh, monitoring uh, uh, spacecraft and communicating uh, on Earth rapidly any potential uh, problems that might be encountered by spacecraft. Coming back to the reason uh, why we are here today and how space technology is supporting life and digital life on Earth, two important examples, uh, navigation, air road, maritime. Uh, all of you are using, for example, uh, Google Maps or the so-called uh, GPS on your uh, mobiles. These, all these services are offered by space technology, satellites. Um, GPS is more popular because it was the first uh, US navigation uh, system deployed, but we also have similar systems deployed by uh, China, India, Japan, and of course, the European Union. Another very relevant example about how space technology is supporting um, life on Earth is related to disaster management. Satellites are helping monitoring climate change, tsunamis or earthquakes. I have chosen a, a brief example, an initiative, the Climate Change in Initiative currently developed by the European Space Agency. Um, with the help of AI, detection rates in Earth observation are improved. Another example, part of this project, the random forests algorithm. So this algorithm uses a training data set to learn to detect different land cover types of areas burned by wildfires. Then computer algorithms are trained in the statistical sense to split sort and transform data to improve data set classification prediction or pattern discovery. As I was mentioning before, space technology supporting uh, digital life. Um, Galileo, the equivalent of GPS, Galileo, the European Global Navigation Satellite System, um, an initiative started back in the 90s that is currently uh, being deployed in the process of becoming uh, fully operational. Um, Galileo is considered a key element in autonomous uh, driving. We have the first um, 
Galileo enabled autonomous vehicle was presented um, by uh, several European researchers in uh, 2019. Um, space technologies are also helping, uh, are also enhancing autonomous maritime transport or uh, precision agriculture. On the left side, um, you will see a picture, an excerpt from uh, a recently uh, issued report by uh, the European Agency dealing with navigation uh, satellite systems. And you will see an official confirmation about the role of uh, satellites in autonomous cars, drones, robots, or Internet of Things. I'm now coming back to my research. Um, so my focus deals with liability aspects. And when we talk about space technology, we can look at liability again from the space exploration part and from the improving uh, life on Earth part. Um, AI systems, uh, we already know, some of them have a series of, of vulnerabilities which may lead to incidents. The question would be if in case, in case of such incidents, if international space law can properly uh, give a solution. Uh, related to this uh, research, I have uh, also made available my uh, recent article written on, uh, the, on the topic and which I will briefly discuss in the next uh, three to maximum four minutes. The other component of my, of my uh, research deals with uh, satellite signal failures and the impact that such failures might have on uh, advanced AI systems. And again, I'm looking if international space law can uh, offer a, a solution. Unfortunately, for the second part of my research, I won't be able to discuss it today because my paper was accepted at the international, the annual International Astronautical Congress in, in October, where I will need to present it. Briefly uh, mentioning the legal basis for liability in space-related activities, and the legal basis is represented by the Outer Space Treaty and the Convention on International Liability for Damage Caused by Space Objects. These are the main documents dealing with uh, liability in the context of outer space. Without getting too lawyerish or too technical from, from a legal perspective, I, I just want to mention um, the main provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. So each state party to the treaty, again, focus on states and not on private actors, um, is liable for the objects that that specific uh, state is launching in the outer space. The provisions of articles of Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty um, were detailed by the Liability Convention, uh, convention mentioned earlier, Article 2 and Article 3. Uh, again, briefly, Article 2, a launching state shall be absolutely liable to pay compensation for damage caused by its space object on the surface of the Earth or to aircraft in flight. So here we have absolute liability. Article 3, dealing with fault-based liability. If the damage is caused elsewhere than the surface of the Earth um, to a space object of one launching state by a space object of another launching state, the latter shall be liable only if the damage is due to its fault. So as opposed to absolute liability or the fault of persons from whom it is responsible. Could you try to get to Yes. The to, I will strictly go to uh, challenges. Um, so as a rule, liability for damage attributable to states is traceable to human actions or omissions in case of advanced AI systems. Um, this traceability uh, might disappear. The notion of space object is also challenged. We have a very brief definition, but we don't know if it also if it might incorporate AI software. 
the notion of fault, uh, as you have seen, a decision made by an AI system will not be the fault of persons. So Article 3 of the Liability Convention is challenged by the ongoing developments of AI. Briefly to mention that these topics will be discussed in the new course called Law and Governance of Outer Space Technologies. And I have mentioned, I have provided here the link for those uh, interested. Also mention other courses offered by our department. Thank you very much. Uh, I am open for questions. Okay, thank you very much. And the floor is open for questions. Okay. Uh, Joanna, thank you for a very interesting and exciting uh, subject and talk. Um, yeah, I was wondering, you were talking about liability, but I was always wondering about ownership. For example, if, if something, uh, if, if, if some country goes to the moon or to Mars and finds there a very interesting, let's say gold, for example, that is um, an interesting um, mining um, ore. Um, uh, who, who is the owner of it? Can, can they simply uh, explore? Is there is there already international law that says that it's um, uh, the the ownership of the of the finder, or it's the ownership of, of humanity, or that, that outer space uh, is also part of the ownership? How, how is that arranged? That is arranged in the outer space treaty, and uh, indeed as anticipated. So I, I can hear you. Oh. <laughs> Can you, can you say that again, please? I, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. So uh, I was mentioning that this, the answer to this question is in the Outer Space Treaty, and indeed the, the ownership belongs to the entire humanity, but uh, private operators have the possibility, so nothing is hindering them um, to explore the celestial bodies. But indeed, this raises... Uh, a lot of discussions these days because if private operators invest a, a lot of money in um, investigating and finding resources, then they are also obliged to, to, to share the, um, their knowledge with uh, the other countries, which makes it a little bit difficult. And one of the main challenges to the outer space treaties and in general to international space law is that according to one, one of the opinions, uh, so these international treaties do not cover the, pre the presence of private operators and they refer slowly uh, to states. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to ask questions uh, as well uh, on, for example, what we discussed earlier today, uh, does it make sense to distinguish AI from other software systems that do things? But uh, I leave that uh, question for now, and I would like uh, 